Andrew, thank you for taking time to speak to us about your latest book, which is Escape to Greer Castle. The setting for this interview is Greer Castle, which is appropriate. So a big thank you to the Greer Castle Trust for allowing us to use the castle as the backdrop to this interview. Andrew, we're really eager to learn more about this captivating story that revolves around the Jewish refugees during the Second World War. So the first question I really have for you is that Greer Castle serves as a central setting in your book. How did you come across this historical story of the Jews at Greer? And what significance does it hold in the story of the Jewish refugees during the Second World War? came across the story, um, I think most people locally know that Jewish refugees were here during the war. But beyond that, not a great deal is known. Um, when my kids were young, they used to come up here a lot, wander around the estates, get close to the castle itself. And bringing young children up here, it occurred to me that other father's children were here. And it became an interest of mine to find out a little bit more. And that's kind of where the passion began to, to find out the background to this story. In terms of significance, it's absolutely huge. Um, 10,000 kinder transport refugees came to this country uh, in 1939 before the Second World War began. The vast majority went into foster care, but a number went into specially created training centres that were created around the United Kingdom. But this was the biggest. This was the flagship of the entire movement. So there, there is a huge story here that has been very quickly forgotten. Okay, so obviously search is, recruit, is crucial when writing historical fact. Could you share some insight into the research process that you had to undertake uh, to accur uh, accurately portray the experience of the Jewish refugees during this period? Well, it was, it was crucial to get that accurate, of course. Um, there are certain, many years of research into this, um, into documentary evidence. There's quite a limited amount of documentary evidence. Um, but significantly, I managed to identify some of the people were here, who were here um, to make contact with many families um, and some of the individuals who were here. Um, access to letters, access to the youngsters here produced their own newsletters internally and a few of those mm -hmm. have survived. So <clears throat> one of the main sources of information was the young people themselves. It was important to me that they tell the story as much as possible. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to speak to the vast majority of them. Um, but during the 70s, 80s and 90s, a significant amount of Holocaust testimony, testimony was recorded. Um, and a number of the children who were here recorded their memories in later years. And access to that was a key part of putting the overall story together. OK, and the story of the Jewish refugees during World War II is a deeply emotional, sensitive subject. How did you approach balancing historical accuracy with telling a story or to cre create a compelling narrative? During the early stages of research, talking to a number of the families, that allowed me to get a better idea of the context for how the story could be told. Um, it is, as you say, a very emotional um, subject, a very difficult subject um, in so many regards. But the historical accuracy is always key. Uh, nothing has been altered to fit any other narrative. And ultimately, by allowing the children as far as possible to tell the story of what happened here, we have the accuracy, but also have the emotional resonance that they perceived. Could you highlight some of the real life events or individuals that inspired characters or situations in your book? There are some truly remarkable people um, involved in this venture. The children, of course, and I could name several of them. Um, who went on to do incredible things in later life. Um, but just to pick one out for the moment, for me, it, it's a man called Arya Handler, um, who was the founder of this. Uh, a young man, 24 years old, already significantly involved in various Zionist projects to get Germans to, German Jews to Palestine. Um, came here following Kristallnacht, um, continued his work here, um, and, and really was a man of great energy, great vision, great passion, great integrity. Um, and I think he's, he's a very inspiring character and a key part of the story. Escape to Greer Castle sheds light on lesser known aspects of World War II history. What message or lessons do you hope readers will take away from this story? There are, of course, huge comparisons that can be made. Um, refugees have always been an issue. And if one wants to, one can make a comparison between how Britain, how this locality reacted to refugees in 1939 and today. 
but I've not drawn those comparisons in the book, and I've deliberately avoided doing so, not so as not to distract from the story. But I think I think there are things in there that may make a reader think. In your opinion, how important is it for literature to explore and remember the stories of marginalised or lesser known groups, such as the Jewish refugees, during the time of significant historical events such as World War II? Hugely important. I mean, clearly the main story, you know, we've all got a reasonable idea of the narrative of World War II. Um, but very often it's the, the items at the edge uh, or the edges of that reality that give you a better perspective of the overall picture. Um, it wasn't just the Jewish refugees here, of course. There's the story of the evacuees that also came into Abigail. And collectively, by collecting these, what might be recalled more fringe stories to the main, uh, main theme, I think it gives us a better understanding of, of the overall situation. Can you describe a particularly impactful or moving moment in your book that you believe captures the essence of the experience faced by the Jews, uh, Jewish refugees at Griech? Uh, there are many. Um, one or two that would stand out is, is, is that dislocation. They were separated from their families, they were separated from the reality they'd always known. They were trying to create a new community here. Um, many of them were still in touch with people back home at the beginning of the war until things, be deportations began and so on. One, two stories that, that I guess spring to mind are in relation to that limited contact they had. There was a young man called Homer Rothman, for example, who received a letter from his mother saying that his father had been arrested and taken to Saxonhausen concentration camp. Mm. And he didn't want to display his emotion. So he describes how he took themselves to one of the toilets here with the letter, just broke down and cried. Came out of the toilet and acted as though nothing had happened. And many of them had those experiences. There's a, and the story is related, it's similar. Um, I don't name the young girl in the book, um, as I was requested not to. But she received news of the deaths of family members, and it broke her. Um, mm -hmm. And she had to leave the castle. She was taken into care. <clears throat> and one of the young people who was here, who was friendly with her, went to visit her about a year later. And he wasn't recognised. But he continued to visit that girl for the rest of her life. She, she obviously died many, many years later. Um, and he made yearly visits, despite the fact that he knew that he was still never recognized. Wow. Wow. That's, that's amazing. The journey of the Jewish refugees is often marked by the resilience and strength. How do you go about portraying these qualities through your characters and their interactions? That was really easy. They do it for themselves by relying on their words, by putting the different stories together into that coherent narrative. Mm -hmm. um, the strength of these individuals just stands out. I mean, the experience that they, they had it is unimaginable, very, very hard to describe. Um, how they coped, the way they coped, um, they tell their own story. Um, to get through this in the way that they did, they, they, were, they were a group of quite remarkable people. What do you hope readers will remember most about the escape to Greer Castle after finishing the book? It will be interesting, actually, for me to find out what people take from it. <laughs> I, I didn't really kind of set out with the aim <coughs> of making a point. Um, this is a story that I felt needed to be told um, as far as possible by the young people. As I mentioned earlier, there is a you could make comparisons with refugees, but it, it's a completely different context. Um, I think one of the key things to me, though, perhaps, is the way that two communities came together. The town of Abigail, just a mile away, the community here, neither knew each other at all at the beginning. Um, and for me in the book, one of the most important aspects is the way that relationship developed and how it became so incredibly strong. A lot of real friendships were formed. Um, mm. and, and just seeing two different groups, two different cultures, mm coming together and understanding each other, I think is, for me, I think many people, if they read the book, will, will pick up on that. Mm. I think Abigail has always been good at that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, writing historical fact requires a delicate balance between fact and creative storytelling. Where are any challenge, were there any challenges you encountered in weaving these elements together and how did you overcome them? Firstly, I hope there's no creative storytelling. It should be historically accurate and well-researched. Um, having said that, the, the opening chapter of the book, the prologue, is a little more novelistic. Mm -hmm. um, it is based on a true story, um, although it is perhaps 
as I say, a little perhaps um, meant to, to entice the reader into the book a little more. Um, but beyond that, it's not creative. Clearly, there were some parts of the story that were not crystal clear or certain assumptions had to be made or certain interpretations had to be made. Um, but I avoided completely the idea of creative storytelling. I, 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 and I think in another sense, this story is so remarkable, um, so huge, it, it doesn't need that sort of input from me anyway. Well, that's, that's, that's actually good to hear, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any specific anecdotes or stories from your research that didn't make it into the book, but left, but left a significant impact on you? Uh, yes, um, several. I, as part of the research, identifying the, the people involved so that I could, could develop my understanding of them. Um, I obviously encountered, for many of them, what happened to members of their family and, the, and their wider experience, which there is an epilogue in the book that, that brings together some of the stories of the key characters, if you like, but there are many, obviously, that, that, that weren't included. Um, but the effects of the Holocaust were absolutely huge. Mm. Um, there is one story that I, I haven't included or, or couldn't really include. Um, everybody I encountered, um, every single person I encountered really was incredibly helpful, um, incredibly open. Um, I only encountered one um, family really who didn't want their involvement to be recognized. Um, and out of respect, I, I, I obviously kept that out, which was a shame because there was one very good story related to it, but obviously I respected that. Um, do you have any future writing projects in mind and will they continue to explore the historical themes or a different genre maybe? Um, when, I, when I began doing this, I was actually working on the First World War locally. That, that's, my, that's my real interest. Um, I have researched over a thousand people locally who took part in the war. Um, and that was uh, just having difficulty on how to actually write that. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. And then this, this came up, this obsession, and it took me away for 10 years. I might return to that. Um, I'm sitting on a lot of stuff. Um, but my real interest, and particularly it's developed during this, is, is I have a genuine interest in local history, not just necessarily Abigail, but local history as a concept. But I think local history is only really of any use if it, if it sheds a light on a bigger picture, on the national picture, or in this case, an international picture. Um, so I am taken with the possibility of looking um, at the, the Canadian soldiers at Kimmel Camp in World War One. I. I know things have been written about that, mm -hmm. um, but maybe that, but I don't know. I might take a little break. I think there's a lot more to do with this, though. Uh, since the publication of the book, I've had two or three people come forward um, mm -hmm. that I hadn't encountered before with, with new information. So there might, be a, there might be a revised version of this at some point. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you, is there any particular aspect of the book or a message you would like to emphasize to potential readers as they consider picking up Escape to Greer Castle? I think you made one very good point for me. Abigailia's community is a fantastic community. Yes, today, and it clearly was back in 1939. Um, but I think I will go back to a comment I made earlier. I, I haven't set out to give anybody a message. Mm -hmm. I think... I would hope the story speaks for itself. Okay, and finally, where could prospective readers pick up a copy of this particular book? It's available here at the castle, it's available on Amazon, um, and can be ordered through Waterstones and WH Smith as well. Andrew, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated. So thank you very much. Thank you.